let me also tell a story of how powerful a single person can be. Uh, uh, Henry David Thoreau was considered to be an eccentric, kind of wacky, um, transcendentalist. And while he was out sort of living on his own next to Walden Pond, and it really is a pond, by the way, not a lake. I've been there. He wrote a little book called Civil Disobedience, and it's still in print. You can get it. So here's this 19th century guy writing this little book. <clears throat> it's more like a monograph than a book <clears throat> about civil disobedience, how to create nonviolent change. So he writes this little book and he publishes it. And Gandhi, who at the time was in South Africa and who was the very picture of an Anglo-Indian he was a young Indian barrister who dressed in English clothes and looked like an English barrister and aspired to be an English barrister. He went to the train station to buy a ticket and he wanted to buy a first class ticket because, well, I'm an English barrister. And they wouldn't sell it to him. They made him ride in the third class because he was an Indian and therefore he was a non-white. This was during the apartheid days <clears throat> and Gandhi it really made him angry and he made a fuss about it and they threw him in jail and while he was in jail and afterwards I don't know how uh, he doesn't record it he came across this little book that Henry David Thoreau had written called <laughs> Civil Disobedience and he read about it and he made the decision he was going to go, he was going to leave South Africa and he was going to go back to India and he was going to get Indian independence. And he was going to do it using the principles in Thoreau's book. And Martin Luther King, a young Baptist preacher, nobody knew. When he got fed up with what was happening about race relations in the United States, he read about Gandhi and Gandhi reading civil disobedience. <laughs> and he um, uh, got a copy of the civil disobedience book and he read it and he studied Gandhi and he said, that's how we're going to get civil rights in the United States. And, and John Lewis, who just died, beaten as he came across the Pettit Bridge, was acting exactly like the salt rioters in India. Civil disobedience, but nonviolent. And so if you think about that, what you get is that one 19th century, largely disregarded, quirky <laughs> transcendentalist sitting a little by a little pond writes a book that changes the course of history for three countries, India, Great Britain, and the United States. And to give you a more modern example, Uh, this is about a story about a 17-year-old schoolgirl named Darnell Fraser. And she was the one who made the videotape of the murder of George Floyd. And she would not be intimidated and she would not stop. And that video that she made on her cell phone, which went viral, created this mass world outcry about police brutality and the racism in the United States. Now, this is one 17-year-old girl at the right place, at the right time, who absolutely would not be intimidated and who was committed to recording something that was wrong and that she was in support of fostering well-being and changing the way things are done. And so when you think that you don't have any power and that you can't make any difference. You don't have any idea. Something that you do or say or think 
and speak about could end up changing the course of the world. But the fact is that the reason, for instance, Gandhi was able to do it or the Quakers were able to accomplish what they did is that they were nonviolent. Because when you create violence, you immediately create a sense of exclusion. There's the guys on my side and the guys on your side. And so you create confrontation and confrontation leads to violence. Whereas if you work with nonviolence, you are inclusive. And so people begin to identify with you at the heart level and they feel involved and they don't feel slighted or put out or whatever. And so nonviolence becomes really critically important. You know, I, I once, I went to New York, this is a few years ago, and I had a friend who was very wealthy. And um, there was something going on at the Follies Berger. And I'd never been there, didn't know anything about it. I, I mean, I just didn't know anything. I, I knew about it, but I had never been there. And he said to me, this is, this is about lunchtime on a Friday. He said, I'll tell you what, let's fly to Paris and we can catch the Follies Berger and then we'll go down to Monaco where I keep my boat and we'll cruise around in the Mediterranean and we'll come back on like Monday or Tuesday. And how would that be? Yeah. And I yeah. thought, well, you know, never having owned a private plane, a private jet and not having a yacht more in Monaco, um, I actually have no idea what that kind of life is like. And that's the problem. When you disconnect from what most people live with, the world that they live in, you lose touch. And it, it's, it's not even that, even if you mean well, it's very hard to understand what well actually means because you live in a completely different, you live in a world where nothing costs too much. You never make a decision. Do I get my child's prescription or do I buy my child food? You just, you know, 40% of Americans can't write a $400 check in a crisis. So they're in a completely different world. So what we need to do is to change our Culture. Again, culture is the collective expression of common intention. We need to change our culture so that it focuses on fostering well being. That's the goal. Forget about parties. Ask yourself which of the people that are running is going to do the most to foster compassionate life-affirming well-being makes things very simple. You don't have to have a lot of, you know, it's not about the political bloviation. It's not about the usual stuff that goes on that you hear on television, the commentary. The question is, does this guy, does this man or this woman support compassionate life-affirming well-being if they do, that's the person I'm voting for. If they don't, I don't. Now they, again, they may not be perfect. They may not do everything that you want, but you have two options. Which option are you going to pick? And if we all pick the well-being one, we will re reclaim the United States. And if we don't, I'm not quite sure what happens. I would say to you that our democracy hangs by a thread. Oh, the form will continue, but the substance will be gone. We're now at a place where the corruption in the country is just, it's just mind boggling. It's, and, and it's so great, they don't even bother to hide it anymore. It's explicit. We've got Stormtroopers. It reminds me of 1933 in Germany when Hitler creates the SS stormtroopers and they go around and, and instead of beating up black people, there weren't any black people or hardly any, but they beat up Jews. Now we're going around beating up black people. It's exactly the same thing. And in fact, 
they even look the same because they're dressed without identification in these paramilitary outfits with the masks and the shields. If you look at the pictures from 1933 and the pictures from 2020, looks exactly the same. One of them is dressed in greenish things. One of them is in black. But basically, it's the same deal. So, and in every instance, you pick the person that fosters well-being the best, even though they're not perfect. Do not, do not let perfection become the enemy of the good. We have to do this. Nobody else is going to do it for us. This is the crossroads for America. And, you know, um, Frost said, two roads diverged in the yellow wood and both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had yet trod black. And I, I chose the one last traveled. And that has made all the difference. And the question is, are you prepared to be an agent of social transition and transformation to foster well-being, or do you choose not to? Thank you.